All right, good. All right, again, thank you for attending Grace Harbor Youth Works Career Connected Learning Zoom series. We're actually in week 14, and today we uh, chose leadership, and we have Chan Sturt with us. I actually attended his leadership class that was hosted through Greater Grace Harbor last year. We have another person in our group here who was in his class last year, uh, Chris Hunt, who's also on our board of directors. So we want to welcome everybody today. We hope that today will be fun and interactive and very educational and informative. Leadership covers many aspects. And although in our past um, series, we were able to bring up a bunch of career fields, but leadership is a skill and a quality of an aspect of your personality or characteristics. Some people are born into leadership and, and some have to learn it. And it was really amazing to learn all the different facets of leadership last year, and we're very honored to have Chance with us. So Chance was raised in the Pacific Northwest. He has spent the past 10 years studying, speaking, and training organizations on leadership and its development. Chance has worked to guide others to make the choice to live their values. These individuals have gone on to build organizations and communities that serve people first. So Chance, with that, I'm going to let you go ahead and take over. Um, Felicia will handle the interviewing. And then as questions come up, we will definitely let you know. So thank you for being here. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, that is kind of fun because we have three generations of Leadership Grace Harbor individuals here with us. So from the first cohort that I took over to the current cohort, because we have Felicia in there as well. I appreciate you having me here. This really does mean a lot to me. Uh, to begin off, it's kind of important to know my story because it really comes from building who I am and when I talk about leadership, what I mean. So, you know, uh, talking about career clusters and figuring out where you want to be in the future. When I was younger, I never thought I was going to go back to school first and foremost. I did not dig it. I was not uh, great in high school. I was bored. I was playing video games in computer club more than actually doing my own classes. You know, after I graduated, things got weird. I spent a year couch surfing. I was homeless. I hung out with my friends. To this day, I think back to one of my friend's moms and how I need to go give her a bouquet of flowers for how much she helped put me back on my feet. Uh, some of the older people will remember the Chris Farley sketch. I lived down in the van and uh, in my river. Lived down in a van by the river. I've done that while keeping a job. So it's weird to think where I'm at. You know, uh, after that, I've went through a lot of different careers. I've worked at the processing plant on uh, shipping for Foster Farms. I've done guitar repair. I've done retail management. For the past 10 years, I have been focusing on higher education. Um, in 2008, I had three different jobs. I was working 100 hours a week. That's not an exaggeration, literally 100 hours a week between three jobs. And my focus, you know, was making money, figuring out what to do next. The economy really tanked in 2008, for those of us that remember it. And I lost all those jobs in a matter of two days. I went back to being homeless. Um, and I struggled with it, figuring out where I was going to go. This is the second time I've been homeless in my life. I had a girlfriend at the time. She, you know, she helped support me, figure out what we're going to do. And a year into it, she said, here's the deal. You can either go back to school or you go in the woods and start cutting down trees with my dad. Her whole family was loggers, is loggers to this day. And, you know, I decided to go back to school. My first quarter there I went to a community college like Grace Harbor's college and I sat there and was like I'm going to be IT that's going to be a great place for me four weeks into the quarter I found myself screaming at a printer in the library and I realized IT was definitely not my deal um, I met people and I came into a program called Trio uh, 
uh, to help students become whatever they want to be, but help them focus on getting their education taken care of and going on to their next, uh, usually going to a bachelor's or something like that. There's a peer mentoring program there. I met with different students for two quarters where every week we touched base and talked. And that's where I found a passion for leadership. I realized everything I had ever done was focused on people. And that's kind of what brings me to today. I have continued on in all of my uh, higher education and leadership studies. I have a bachelor's from Eastern Washington University in interdisciplinary studies, focus on leadership. Uh, from Gonzaga University, my master's is in the organizational leadership, concentration on servant leadership. And everything I've ever done since then has really been focusing on how we bring people together, how we bring people into our group, how we create community, how we create a tribe. And, you know, thinking about where we're at in the world, there's a lot of connectivity that we can have, but some of us are still feeling lost. So my focus is how you bring people together as a leader. I'm gonna let everyone in on a really big secret about leadership. Nobody has an idea what it is. Everyone argues about it. There are so many different metrics. Every speaker, every professor you talk to is going to give you a different idea of what leadership is. So the first and foremost thing you have to do is figure out what leadership is to you. When, we, when I talk about leadership, I talk about what I'm teaching my kids. I have two girls and a little boy, everyone under six years old. If I can't talk to them about uh, leadership and have them understand, I don't bring it to my programs. I don't bring it to my classroom. I don't bring it to my trainings because leadership should be that simple. Uh, this morning as I was getting ready today, I thought, when I say leadership, what does that mean? It kind of gets simple. Am I focused on people? Am I focused on them getting better? If the people you surround yourself are getting better, you might be a leader. If they're doing better in their work, they're finding more productivity, you know, that's kind of my metric. Being in a position of leadership is a lot different than being a leader, though. There's power dynamics. Just because I'm the CEO or the director or the manager, I have authority, I have power that I can tell people what to do. And that can be a part of leadership, but when you find that true essence of leadership, it's about people coming to you and wanting to help you no matter what position you have. If you can ask people to help you get somewhere without ever having the power to tell them to do so, that's when you know you have leadership. That's when you know you're doing something better. The way I put it to my uh, girls when they say they want to be princesses, I ask, how is the kingdom going to be better because of you? How are you, you know, you get the fancy dresses, you get to go do the ball, but you have to take care of everybody else. You have to earn that fancy dress. You have to earn going to the ball. When I talk to my boy, he likes trucks. At two years old, that's all he wants to talk about. I'm like, okay, you want to drive a truck, you have to take care of other people. There's leadership, there's management. Management works on that policy, the procedure, those rules that keep us going. Leadership is that special place where we find people, where we start focusing on what do they need to make the world better. And this isn't just a heartfelt, oh, touchy-feely, let's have all the people go together. When we actually look at the research and the numbers, those organizations that have the best leadership do better when they serve their communities, when they serve the people they work with, that translates into more money. The top 10% of the Fortune 500 companies, the best companies in the world doing the best, are really leadership-based organizations. The top 5% of those that are making the most money doing the best treat people as though they were the best, most important thing because they are. And that's where we get all this value of leadership. So it is, it transcends what position you are at. It doesn't matter if you're the entry level person or if you're the CEO. When we talk about leadership, these are the skills that organizations want 
and need in order to thrive. Right now we're seeing a lot of stuff going on in our world since January. From January to today, we are looking at a crisis of leadership. The funny thing is, there's people been writing of a crisis of leadership since the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, Robert Greenleaf was the first person to say servant leadership. In the 70s, he was saying, we are missing the leadership that will take care of each other. So I guess my first question is to you today. What does leadership look like to you? When you think that's a great leader, here's one of the funny things. Sometimes it's hard to say what a great leader is, but we can feel it before we can speak it. So when you think of a great leader, how do they make you feel? How do they make your workday feel? Or if you're thinking about a teacher, when you walk into that teacher's class, how do you feel? And uh, please, I hate hearing the sound of my own voice. I'd rather hear yours. So if you have thoughts, feel free to throw it in the chat. Uh, unmute yourself. I want to hear from you. This is a conversation between all of us. Thank you so much, Chance. And I really appreciate your saying um, or tying in leadership with what is going on today. Um, as you know, um, we're in a pandemic. We have a lot of protests going on and people are very concerned about the economy and going back to work. Um, so it's been interesting to see how different leaders in a variety of positions are, are dealing with these challenges today. Um, when I think about a leader though, I, I go back to this Air Force General, uh, General Silveria, uh, Silveria um, and I almost want to pull it up on YouTube because it's so great, but, I, <laughs> but maybe another time. I'll probably put it in an email. But he was uh, dealing with an issue at the Air Force Academy regarding race and racism. And he pulled all of the people in the academy, uh, the students, the faculty, everybody, he pulled them in, into a big meeting and he talked about the issue. And he actually um, had all of the cadets hold up their cell phones and record him, um, record him saying, um, that they will not tolerate discrimination of any form. And it brought tear to my eyes uh, um, because he's such a, it was just like a powerful moment. He's wearing a uniform. Um, he's a leader. When I think about leaders, I, I think about military leaders sometimes. And it was just amazing how he, um, he was able to translate the values of inclusivity to his cadets in that way using having them like record him saying that because now that's on their phone and they if they ever have a question about it they can just hit the record button so i thought that it was just spectacular that um, is one of the most valuable things about leadership is the only thing we can control is ourselves uh to be honest two weeks ago i was doing a talk for a conference and i got pushed back in how do we get people of color to come join our nonprofit board? And how do we make our nonprofit board see this? And I got scared. Because it's not somewhere I can talk. To. I, as a white male, I cannot talk to a person of color. And my leadership is to open the door so that they have an opportunity and a place to speak. And I got backed into a corner. Well, we have to show them. We have to. We have to. We have to make them. And it took me a week to realize they put me off my game because they weren't talking about leadership. We have to make them is not leadership. When you say this is what the ideal I'm going to show, I'm going to live my life. You can be with me or you cannot. Especially when it comes to big issues of inclusivity, uh, bringing people in of all viewpoints, backgrounds, race, nationality, ethnicity, you have to walk that walk. Uh, there is a Washington State not, uh, Community College president who just retired not too long ago, who is known for saying, if you do not bring me a diverse applicant pool, I'm going to throw it away. We will not even hold hiring for these positions unless it's diverse people from diverse backgrounds to bring something better to our college. That's leadership. So when you're talking about that, it's having to walk the walk for you first, no matter what everybody else is doing. And that is an uncomfortable place. Sometimes I'll be honest with you, it sucks to be a leader because you have to do the hard things 
and you have to stand up to difficult situations and conversations. But when people see that you're willing and able to do that, oh, I get goosebumps right there. Just thinking about that, that's a different level. Uh, we have someone in the chat. Did you want to check that one for us? Absolutely. This is from Kat, uh, our Lake Quinal intern, and she says, a person that isn't afraid to do it, do the work first before they ask you to. Um, she also says they make jokes, but they also work really hard at what they do. And they show you the right things to do and motivate you, making you want to do it as well as be a better version of yourself. That's excellent, uh, Kat. Kat, you're talking about something called transformational leadership, where a leader wants to show you the way. Um, and by showing you the way and being there to be with you, they help you uh, jump to greater heights. One of my favorite stories is about a CEO of a car rental company. And he's making the big decisions whether or not we have to lay people off, whether we have to you know, spend money, whatever. But he would go from being in his big office at the top to being in the call center taking customer service calls once a week. Even if it's that hour or two, he was willing to do the work from the top to the bottom. And yet again, that's one of those things that's sometimes hard to describe, but you can feel that. Cheryl says, I like the difference. I learned about management versus leadership. I agree with that good and bad traits, and then the Myers-Briggs personality assessment. <laughs> Can you tell our students a little bit about some of these assessments uh, that kind of uh, test who we are? Um, so I am certified for something called the Myers-Briggs uh, personality assessment, and it is this really cool tool that started being developed in the 1920s. So when we talk about extrovert versus introvert, this is where we begin. If you've ever heard of the uh, social scientist Carl Jung, that came out of his ideas of the unconscious, subconscious, um, the conscious brain. And um, so Myers Briggs breaks in our personalities into four different uh, letters so extrovert, introvert, um, and a couple others. And it helps us kind of to see maybe the way we prefer to be in our home life versus how we are at work, um, how we do our work. So I am a very extroverted person. If you see, I can't stop my hands from going. When I do a six hour session uh, for Leadership Grace Harbor, I usually walk about five to six miles on that because I'm pacing back and forth. I wanna hear what people are doing. That's an extroverted trait. I like talking to people. I'd rather Zoom call than phone call any day. Um, but there's also other things like um, sensing and perceiving. So sensing might be, I need the fine details of the situation in order to start processing that information. Other people might prefer the big picture of the idea. I'm a big picture. I want to know what the story is. If we are going to build this building, why are we going to do it? Well, Grace Harbor Youth Works is going to hold seminars there. That's important to me. For other people, it might be really important for them to know, well, how much is that going to cost and how many uh, boards are we going to need? What kind of footage, square footage are we going to need? Part of leadership is finding a middle ground where you can find value in all of that. Um, we all have things that we prefer to do, but when we're connecting to other people and we are making these relationships, and that relationship is the foundation of leadership, we always don't get to do what's comfortable for us. We have to work on what's comfortable for other people. And so the Myers-Briggs gives us an idea. And there's a lot of things. You can see um, there's the five colors, there's the Ingram. There's a lot of different personality assessments out there. To me, I don't care what you use. That is not what matters. What matters is how you use it. So if we have all this information, and I know there's a pers one person on my team that is introverted and they don't like people to come into their office, they'd rather have an email, I might be okay if enough I have to have a face-to-face -face 10 minutes before say, hey, I have to head over to your office to have a conversation about this. Give them a little bit of time to have some mental um, acrobats, you know, stretch their mental muscles so they're ready to go. Uh, this, 
these set of books right here is all Myers Briggs content that I've actually went through. Um, we have stuff that we can talk about team building. We can talk about um, emotional intelligence. That's one of the biggest asks for leaderships out there right now. Um, emotional intelligence is the ability to know yourself, know your emotions well enough that you can stop and then have a response. It's easy to have an emotional reaction, but how do we have an intelligent response? So sometimes it's good that I get angry. I think angry is the most valuable emotion that I have. I use it the most because when I know I'm angry, I know something's threatening my values. Getting angry and being angry with others is different though. Uh, there's the saying, it's okay to be angry as long as you can be angry at the right person at the right time for the right situation and the right amount. I can't do that. So sometimes just knowing what that emotion is is important to me. Um, and you know, management versus leadership, we need both. Uh, we have to have policies and procedures that keeps an organization going. Um, HR offices really are there to help people and the organization stay safe. We have to keep the organization safe so most people can be uh, employed. But when we talk about leadership, it's easier to create change with leadership and relationships. You can create change either way, but when you have people on your side, it's easier to change policy. If you're just gonna say, this is the way we're gonna do it, rah, 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 people will have to follow you if you're in power, but that doesn't mean they're gonna like it. That doesn't mean they're gonna buy in, that doesn't mean they're gonna help you. So how do you make sure that whatever you're building, people are gonna be with you? I'd rather have you know, a couple ride or die people that are with me to the end than have you know, half buy-in from 40 people. Two versus 40, I'll take the two any day for part of my tribe wanna get where they need to go. Um, I appreciate those, uh, your response, especially in regards uh, to personality and how leaders are truly able to understand how people are in terms of their personality traits and how they work. And I think that's kind of part of being a, a leader, right? Uh, being able to know your people so that you're putting them in the best uh, situation or task for success. Some of the best leaders we find out there aren't the most skilled um, engineers or the person with the most uh, knowledge of accounting or maybe the most uh, skilled mechanic. It's the people that can bring all those people together. So when we're talking about uh, personality types, as a leader, you don't always get to choose your team. You don't always get to choose who you're surrounding yourself by. And that's true of real life, even with my family. I love my whole family. That doesn't mean I want to be around them all the time. Um, that's same for my work group. But I have to be the glue. I have to be the good person. Um, I have to be the leader in that situation. I see um, something, another question from Kat. How do you control that emotion? Do you have a technique that helps you calm down and assess the situation better? That's excellent, Kat. Great questions. And everyone, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Oh, please do, please do. Um, so the first time I heard the term emotional intelligence, I was going through a training based on this book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. And it's the one I still use in our uh, session. Um, if you go through an emotional intelligence training, most likely you're gonna get that book. Felicia, have you received yours yet? Okay, so perfect, it got sent out. Um, controlling emotion is a long process sometimes. There's a lot of different, perfect, a lot of different ways to do that. So this book is fun. It has a bunch of different ways that we can control our emotions. Or control our emotions is a, maybe a bad way to be speaking about that. Um, first thing we have to do when we talk about emotional intelligence is be self-aware. I know what triggers my anger quickest. Mess with my kids, mess with my wife, mess with my body. So when you start treating people as secondary to money, I don't do well. I get grouchy. To be honest, I usually get a little bit mean. 
um, because I, that really upsets me. It strikes at one of my core values. But there's stuff like, um, where is it? Um, lean into your discomfort. I do things that are scary to me on purpose. I go hiking on strange, uh, big hiking hills. I go, I want to go skydiving one day because that scares the crap out of me. I'm not afraid of heights. I'm really afraid of a sudden stop at the bottom of a fall. Um, so I want to go do that because I know my body will react in a similar way as though I were angry, which is one of those things we do. We feel our emotions physically. Uh, what do you say when you're feeling uh, upset? Sometimes you say my stomach hurts. Um, I feel like I'm going to throw up. That could be disgust. That could be anxiety. Um, when you feel yourself start sweating, when you feel yourself a uh, drain of color, when those are things that your body could be telling you that, hey, you're in an emotionally um, risky situation. Um, you know, I, I got emotional before I got on here. I started sweating a little bit. I could feel myself bouncing. I've also had a full pot of coffee because I drink a lot of coffee. Those are some of the things we could feel. So when we start needing to be aware, we can then start to manage those. Um, one of the best things we can do is count to 10. Take your deep breaths. We teach that to young kids because it's important. When your body has a stress response, gets excited, gets scared, it does certain things, whether it's um, physical scared, emotional stress, whatever that is, it does the same thing. Those deep breaths. Two deep breaths made me feel better. My, my shoulders start to relax a little bit. Simple things like that. I'm not talking about, you know, doing 20 years of hard effort on some of these things. It's the little things that matter the most, whether you're a leader of people or leader of self. And a lot of this leadership starts with leader of self. Um, Alicia, I will send you out a bunch of different stuff if you want on um, emotional intelligence and um, emotional management techniques. I have a good flyer I'll send your way that you can throw out to everybody too. Oh, thank you so much, Chance. Uh, this is a great conversation. We have Cheryl and she asks, what is the best quality for a great leader? All right, Cheryl, unmute yourself because you need to tell me what the best uh, quality for a great leader is. What do you think it is? It is listening. You need to listen to those around you and, and be able to understand where they're at and then order to put together a plan for whatever your goals are and facilitate that to those around you. For some weird reason, I felt like you were going to say that. Sorry, I got toys everywhere, so I got I have visual aids. Um, earlier, uh, Felicia had asked, who are some of your role models and favorite leaders and why? That would be my fun co-pop of Abraham Lincoln. I keep him where I can see him at all times because he was renowned not only for trying to stop slavery, but he was really, really focused on being able to listen to people. Um, people who dramatically differed from his thoughts and views. Whether he could concede to the South what they wanted or not was one thing. But making sure to listen and say they were heard. As a leader, you don't always get to tell people, okay, I like your idea, we're going with it. But making sure they are heard, making sure they're part of the process, making sure that they are integrated into that is vital. The number one skill, as actually, <laughs> most of our organizations, and our leader leadership is listening. The ability to listen and bring in the information and data from vastly different places. Uh, the reason I love Lincoln too is part of my graduate program. I took a class only focused on listening. I have a workbook around it. I'm surrounded by books, so I would try to find it, but I'm not going to. There's leadership books there, comic books, those are crazy in the office. Um, but if you want to see great listening in action, 
there's the movie Lincoln with Daniel Day-Lewis and Tommy Lee Jones. It's amazing how little they portray him talking in that movie. Surrounding him, he has fewer lines than some other people. But when he spoke, he spoke with conviction and passion, and it was... The other side wants me to concede that this is okay, and I refuse. In the foundation of me, it is not right. I have listened to their pleas, and I cannot abide. That is powerful. To this day, it's probably been five, six years since I watched that. I got a little shiver right there just thinking about it. Um, I also um, have uh, Ellie, who is our uh, social media intern, and she asks, what can you do to help motivate the people you are leading? I think that really boils back into what we were just talking about. What do they need? Every person is different. Everyone has different experiences. So first and foremost, by listening to them, that's where it all begins. Um, some people I know at Grace Harbor College, there are quite a few people that I used to have candy in my desk. I know what chocolate they wanted. This person wanted Skittles. This person wanted um, Starburst. That's something simple, but they knew that I listened. So when I asked for IT help, I might have went to the front of the line. Um, you have to listen to who's around you and what they need. Um, there is a book that my wife loves. It's called Love Languages. And it talks about how we give love and receive love. My wife is an acts of service and a by person. Uh, gifts. So she'll do the dishes for me because she knows it stresses me out. She'll bring me a... Um, burger because it knows she knows it makes me happy those sort of things can help motivate people but you have to know you know just because I want to give this way doesn't mean I receive this way um, one of the ways that I find you know love or being motivated or find leadership is I want people to spend time with me come have a cup of coffee with me not particularly in my wife's love language but you know we spend some time we take a quick coffee break in the morning with each other. Those sort of little things, listen to the people around you and you kind of go from there. I love that because Jordan Meyenberg, um, who's from Pac Mountain, he says, I agree. I don't know everything and I don't want to either. Listening and reacting are very important pieces of leadership. And like you're saying, of relationship, relationships as well. I refuse to do accounting. I refuse to do numbers. You don't want me to mess up your budget. But you tell me what your budget is and why you're doing it, and I can help you tell the story of why it's important. There's, see, you know, we need the numbers to know what the budget is and what we can buy, but we need people to buy in. And again, we're building relationships even with the budget. You know, we ask for a grant. Part of a grant, part of the reason people give us money is because they know the reason why. The numbers are important. Do we have enough to give it? But what's going to happen? I dig it. Hey, I would like some of our interns to jump in on this conversation. Um, you know, you guys have um, friends, of course. You are, some of you are involved in sports. Some of you are involved in other activities. And I'm pretty sure that you all have had um, experiences leading a group. So... What have, has been some of your experiences like as leaders yourself? Um, have you had any difficult experiences? And do you have any questions? Uh, we have a great instructor here for you right now <laughs> to uh, be able to help you uh, uh, with some of the things that you've experienced as leaders. One of the first foundational times we get to be leaders is in sports. Um, my daughter is was four when she had her first uh, team. She's on a soccer team. That's the first time she got to experience that, being a part of a group, being a part of a community. And, um, you know, that's where we get to learn those things for the first time a lot of the time. Well, this is wonderful. We have a question from Ellie. When you are trying to lead young kids, you need to have random games and sometimes even food ready for when they get a bit too restless. <laughs> and I'm, I'm oh. laughing because food is a huge thing 
Um, but yeah, with young kids, you have to definitely have the games. I love it. When we talk about, you know, one of the activities I do is, what do you need to have a good meeting? The first thing people always say is snacks. We need something to eat, we need something to drink. Because if you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it goes, in order to be a fully realized person, you have to have your physical needs, you need to have a place to sleep, you need to have food, water, comfort. That's one of the first things you need to be to be a good human being. And then you can kind of go up this ladder and at the tippy top are intellectual needs. Feed the belly and the mind will work. I love that. Feed the belly and the mind will work. Does um, a lot better. That will take a nap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have, yeah, good meeting food. Absolutely. Um, so um, again, does anyone have some questions for Chance? Here's JP. Thank you, JP. How do you stay calm when someone is frustrated with you or something else that is bothering them? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a really good one. If you were asking me personally, I will be super honest with you. I don't. I get just as frustrated. I get just as anxious and I get just as emotionally charged. Just because I feel that doesn't mean that I get to let it out. And to be honest with you, uh, emotional, controlling my emotions is something I've done, been working on since probably middle school. It has been a years long battle. So um, I have had individuals come up to my face and scream and yell. Uh, when I used to work at GameStop, I had a 42-year-old man um, yell on my face for three hours because I wouldn't sell him a mature-rated game. It's a $50,000 fine. Not to the organization, not to the company, but to me. It wasn't worth it. All I could do was be quiet, be calm. Part of that was letting them get it out. Sometimes when people are angry or frustrated, they just want to say their piece. Not always, but you know, so for me, I have to just bottle that up for a minute and say, thank you for that. And there's been times my voice has shaked. I've been close to crying. That is okay because I'm a human being and that's what human beings do. It's okay to walk away from some situations. It's okay to say, I don't have anything productive to say right now. I'd like to come back to this conversation in a little bit. Uh, when I worked as a student support specialist at the college, I had a really difficult conversation with the supervisor. And I said, I can't continue this because I do not want to say something I don't mean. I'd like to schedule a time to come back to this. These are not easy things, but it's kind of some personal work you have to do. And that's a big part of leadership. You have to dig in and get to know yourself better than some people want to. Um, what do you do when someone else, uh, is bothering or when something else is bothering them? Listen, yeah. um, there's a lot of times I will ask somebody, do you want me to listen or do you want me to problem solve? Cause not everybody wants their problem solved. Um, it is difficult. I'm not saying it is, uh, an easy thing, but it's one of those things that's why I put myself in uncomfortable positions, uh, difficult places. When I go do my workout, I like to be miserable by the end of it because I know what my body can do. I know what I can mentally handle. That is a part of that. Um, listen and ask, you know, shut off the inner voice that's talking. Don't speak or don't listen to respond. Listen to hear. Because we are always wanting to say something. Um, there's been countless times I've been talking to Felicia, for example. She puts up some really good points, and I want to throw up my experience against it. That's not what that time's about. This is about Felicia saying what she's thinking or feeling, and I need to make time for that. And if I can't remember what I was going to say at the end of that, it probably didn't matter. It may not be relevant anymore because we may talk to someone else. 
So it's a weird balance of listening and staying in the situation as well. Oh my gosh, I, I just really love that because um, learning how to manage our emotions um, is huge. And this leads to um, Ellie's question here. What do you do when someone questions the decision you made? And she says, in a negative way. One of the most difficult things we can do as leaders is decide how much information needs to go out there. Um, the higher up you are in an organization, you see things different. You have more information, you have a deeper view from like a frontline employee to a CEO. The CEO knows the big numbers, knows the big picture. One of the things as a leader, you have to decide how much of that you're going to share. I like something called radical, radical transparency. It puts me in a hard place because I say, let it all be known. Not all, all organizations work that way. But you know, when we give the information of here's why I made this decision, it's not a an easy one, it's not a popular one, but it's the best one we can have. Say layoffs. We had a lot of organizations furlough or lay people off right now, and that's not popular with anybody. I tell you, the CEO doesn't want to do it. HR doesn't want to do it. The people who are being laid off doesn't want to do it. It's not fun. It's not easy. Most CEOs sees the damage it does to their families, their communities, the larger picture. But if we, it could be the question of if we lay 20% of our workforce off right now, we can ensure that the other 80% is going to stick around and we can make sure they're taken care of. If we only lay off 10%, maybe we're risking another 50% of the other one. Letting people know that we can find some sort of normalcy and you might be able to offer people the opportunity to come back. One of the best leader I've ever seen you know, would find somebody who's negative, breaking down the team, not being a good part of the culture of the organization. Say, hey, I'm sorry, you don't fit here. Here's some organizations I've already reached out. If you want an interview, we can get you there. But for here, you're not the right fit. How you treat people and the way you talk to them will really define how people question you. And you have to be okay being questioned to be a leader. Being in a position of power, it's really easy to say, well, this is what I say, just do it. If you wanna be a leader, you have to explain why. Part of um, being a leader is what's called vision making. You have to try to find out what the future is. You have to figure out what you want that to be and you have to share it again and again and again. It's like being a social media influencer. Whatever you are trying to put out there in the social media, if you're trying to be um, a TikTok dancer or if you're trying to be a transition specialist, which some of those transition specialists are ridiculous. I love the YouTube compilations of just them. That's their message. A lot of these people aren't doing separate things. They're doing the same thing over and over again. So when I come talk about leadership, the drum that I beat is relationships. That's about listening, about people. If we're not talking about people, then I'm not talking about leadership. I could be talking about management. I could be talking about product management. I could be talking about a lot of things, but if I'm talking about leadership, it's about people. Um, we just did a session through Leadership Grace Harbor about project management. It, it was about stages of a project and how you treat the people in between there. How do you get them on board? How do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them motivated? What do you do to bring them together? Like even technology, how are you communicating with technology? It would be fun to be there and sit down with you. The fact that we can't, but we can still see each other makes me happy. We can still connect. We can be here. You know, the video game streamers, those people that are streaming their lives, that's a way that they're connecting and sharing their message. So how you listen and how you talk to people matter and the information you share matters. If someone's being negative, you have to ask why. What did you do that they have a negative reaction? You can only control yourself, 
sometimes people are going to be negative, but what can you do to maybe change the message, change the metho methodology in the future? And I love that because it goes back to being comfortable with yourself and um, knowing yourself um, so that you can, or, or just being in that, er, that space of uncomfortability and feeling that discomfort, but asking that question anyways, asking like, well, how come you're upset? How, how can I help? Um, this is awesome. This is from Brianna, who's our intern at Wishka. She says, I was captain for my basketball team at regionals last year and a couple of my teammates were having a hard time handling the pressure from the game. How do you help others with pressure? Wow. Yes, how do you help others with pressure and stress? Excellent, Brianna. Throwing some good questions out there. Um, It can be difficult to handle pressure and stress. How do you do that? I hate to go back to the same old song and dance, but what do they need? Um, if you're going to be the leader, how you react to that pressure and stress will show everyone else how to. If you get mad and throw a chair or you know start cursing out the ref or any number of things, you set the tempo you set the tone. Um, we see that in a lot of the protests that are going on right now. Those who are peaceful are doing really well. When one person starts to get a little bit more anxious or anxiety in there, we can see things maybe get a lot further than people want them to. Um, and it doesn't even have to be, somebody could egg you on. It could be a parent from another team that starts to egg you on it gets you even more upset. Um, agent provocateur is what it's called in technical terms. Someone who's from outside your organization that's just there to rile you up. That's a possibility. So when you're talking about dealing with stress, deal with it a little bit at a time. Don't let it build up. So if you know that you're coming up to your um, a big game with a rival school, what are you doing to take care of this situation beforehand? You're gonna feel that anxiety. You know, it, COVID makes things weird. It could be a good time to go have a walk. Maybe you get everyone on a Zoom call and say, hey, I wanna do a check-in. I've done that throughout COVID and said, hey, anyone that wants to come and join us, let's just come and talk about how we are, how we're doing. Stress and pressure are there, and they're good things. We think of them as a really bad thing. The way a diamond is created is by coal being just ground down by pressure and heat. Great people are made the same way. You know, if you start out life with everything handed to you, it can be real easy just to coast. But when you start out and you have struggles and you have pains, and it is not an easy situation. That's when we, I almost feel that we're called to a greater good. We're called to a greater time. Um, it would have been really easy for me to give up, to stop. COVID, I almost did. I'm busier now than I was before COVID because I didn't stop. I have more going on, more people wanting me to come talk, more people wanting me to do seminars. Pressure and stress are not Bad. They're how you get strong. Your muscles don't get bigger without you lifting weights. Your emotional muscles have to go through the same thing. Your intellectual muscles, that's why we go to school. That's why we go and do trainings. I have a master's degree. I'm still going to a certificate training. I just was told I get to go. I'm doing eight weeks of school for no reason other than I know it's good for me. I read gigantic long technical manuals, not because I enjoy it, but because I know it's gonna be good for me. So as we're talking about this, don't look at stress and pressure as something that's gonna grind you down because anything that's ground off was extra. We're getting down to the diamond. We're getting down to the part of you that can shine and do whatever they want. 
we are in strange, weird, chaotic times. We get to decide what the world looks like from here on out. How we act, how we react, how we respond, is how the world is going to be different after this. That's exciting. It's, it's scary, but it is very exciting. That's brilliant. I'm writing that down and stealing it. <laughs> uh, well, we're almost coming to the end of our conversation, but I have a, a cool question here. Um, what's the most important risk you've taken as a leader um, and why? I have to lay myself bare a little bit here then. Uh, the biggest risk I have ever taken is believing in myself. Um, I come from a family where I was the first one to graduate middle school, let alone high school, let alone go back to college, let alone have a master's degree. Uh, my family doesn't understand what I do. It is weird that I'm not an iron worker or a logger because that's what my family does. This is what I do. I teach some on the side, but I talk to people. I do trainings. I talk about leadership all day long. This is my life. You can ask, I think I started saying it in Chris's uh, cohort that I was going to make a website. I know I said it in Cheryl's. It was about a month ago that the website was up and it's still not out there like I want it to be. The biggest risk I've had is taking a good hard look at myself and saying I'm enough to change this world. And you know, it may not be the whole world I get to change. I have one last one. I want to tell you something that keeps me up at night, something I think about so much. Um, and it's a little bit dark, but it, it makes me, it's happy, it's exciting. There's the, the philosophy of the two deaths. That we each die two deaths in our life. The first time when we leave our body and the last time someone says our name. I say it and I get goosebumps every time. The last time I want someone to say my name is with love and respect and Chance did something amazing. That's how I live my life. So when I talk about the risk that I take in myself, it's because I don't want to do a simple thing. I want to spread love. I want to build community. And I want people to be there with me. I believe in the brotherhood of the family of the world, of humanity. We are all in this together. You are all my brothers and sisters. We can be that family. It is a greater calling than... It's a greater calling than any one person can stand up to. But believing that I can reach out to people and build that community, that's, that's the biggest risk I'm taking. And I'm taking it every day. And I'm excited that I am. Because if you don't risk for you, nobody else will. I think that's huge. We, we definitely have to invest in ourselves. And that, it, it takes courage sometimes, you know, especially if you're feeling down about yourself or you have greater issues going on. That is just, it's beautiful. I, I'm about ready to cry. Um, Cheryl says, <laughs> I know, seriously, you're like, ah, make me cry. I just want to make a positive difference in people's lives. And that's a good one, Cheryl. And I'd like you to unmute yourself um, because you're a leader too. You are the executive director of Grace Harbor Youth Works. Um, and I would like to ask you, how do you continue to grow and develop as a leader? Well, Felicia, that's a real excellent question due to the fact that I've never done this before. So it's a day-by-day -day opportunity for me uh, to take all my experience through my life, good and bad, to put it in a positive manner to do what our goal is in this program and in life. Um, I, it's not, not one thing. It's just whatever opportunity comes up, you got to move on it, figure it out. And again, the, the key thing is listening. I was thinking about it yesterday. Oh. There was a couple examples that somebody's not listening. And I could hear that. I mean, I could see that because of their responses. And it's just like if, if people would just listen to each other, I really think that we would 
a better opportunity to make a, a bigger difference and work as one as what Chance is saying. Um, and, and with all of our different personalities and, and all of our experience and knowledge put together, if we could just change all that and make it into a positive thing, I mean, we could just go and do anything and help anyone and, and, and be there for each other. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or not, but that's just off the, my top of my heart and my compassion and, uh, and helping in kids, our, our youth, our youth are our future. And that's why my um, goal right now is with the youth. I also feel that if I didn't have to work, I'd probably volunteer a lot of my time to seniors because their their lives are where, I, why, where, where we're at and the knowledge and the experience and their memories are huge. And I miss having grandparents. Um, I, I miss hearing about their, their lives. So, uh, but right now it's our youth and the way that the world is today, uh, we need to assist them the best we can and help them make good choices and help hopefully change our world to become a better positive place to live. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, and I'm just from what you're saying, I, I wanna make sure I get Kat in here. Um, she actually said something about 15 minutes ago um, about leadership, staying confident in a hard situation when your team is down or they are going to lose, try to keep them up. And she says, showing them that, they, that you aren't giving them up, giving up. So leading by example, absolutely. Talking them up, trying to bring their spirits up and don't show them you are upset. <laughs> um, so I love it. Sometimes you have to be the cheerleader and sometimes you have to like fake it until everyone makes it. I totally get that. Um, she says, sometimes showing you are a little upset, but still trying, uh, they will come back and work as a team. And she also says down here, we have to be advocates for ourselves to become a great leader and to help others. Well said. And then I think everyone sees what Chance said here. Small steps and small choices are the biggest opportunities for leadership and change. Wow, I, I love this. This is a, a fantastic a topic for our meeting today. And I'm, I'm really glad we got to focus on the elements of character and values um, because that's what we take into not only our careers, but our lives. Um, so um, Chance, would you like to give us a, a little wrap up here and then we're going to end the meeting, but the students can stay on to do feedback and check in. And I believe um, we're gonna kind of meet with Jim as well. So go ahead, Chance. Uh, first and foremost, I really, again, thank you for having me out. I mean, out, I'm still in my office. Um, thank you for letting me come and talk. I really appreciate uh, Cheryl, Chris, and Felicia. You have all been bright spots in my own personal leadership and my own growth. Uh, leadership Grace Harbor program is a huge part of my heart. I spent the past week evaluating the past three years. Um, to your students, really think about who you want to be in the world. What kind of change do you want to make? And change doesn't have to be, you know, we're doing something global. We're doing something nationwide. What can you do in your home? What can you do in your small community? And I don't care if you want to be a diesel tech. How is that going to be the best damn mechanic shop out there? How is your human services going to be the most outreach, how is your nursing going to be heartfelt and fed? My leadership starts at home and so can yours. When you talk to people, let them know you care for them. Let them know that they're important to you. I, just, I have a buddy in England. I've never met him face to face, but we Zoom call a lot. I just sent him a video making fun of his flowers because mine are prettier. I'm building community. Build your community, build your tribe, bring people around you. Leadership is about those relationships and success in life is about those relationships. Your technical skills are important. They will get you the job you want, but to get to where you want to be eventually, relationships and people are going to be a focus. Always keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, Thanks, Chance, for being with us.
Thank you.